Good afternoon. My name is David McNeil. I'm a Clojure developer at, uh, on the Lano Core or Lano Cloud team at Viasat. And I'll be talking about a, uh, a library that we've built for working with core async code. Uh, so core async is a Clojure concurrency library. And as an aside, all the work and all my slides are talking about the closure, the proper closure version of these things, not the closure script version, just because that's the, the context which I'm working in. Uh, but core async is fundamentally about the idea of creating these concurrent threads that can communicate asynchronously via channels. So it's all built to be concurrent, so you can have many threads all producing items going into a channel, and on the opposite side, many threads kind of concurrently taking items out of channels. The basic operators you have are, first you have Go, so anything inside of the Go will run in a separate concurrent thread, and it's not an OS thread, it's not a JVM thread, it's, an, it's a lighter weight mechanism that's part of Core Async itself. Uh, you create channels for communicating items by calling chan, and here I'm showing calling it with the, the value three, which will set a max buffer size in that channel of three, uh, of three. And then you can read and write from channels. So greater than, less than, bang. The greater than, bang to a channel, you can write a value x. And on the, the consuming side, you can do less than, bang on a channel, and that will produce an item from the channel. So we take those operators and package them up in uh, what I'll kind of call an asynchronous function. So here we've got a function f, which inside of it is using go threads and channels to do something. In this case, it starts three threads. One writes a value of one to a channel. The other one writes a value of two to another channel. The third channel, or the third thread reads both those channels, sums the result, prints out the answer. And this basic way of packaging up uh, asynchronous code into a function is uh, the basis on which the library we built runs. So if you had a function like this that did async things, then you could take this and you could run it inside of our, uh, what we call step machine. So this shows creating a step machine. Um, in general, you can give it configuration parameters. In this case, it just takes all the defaults. Telling that step machine what function it needs to run, and it expects to have a function that is doing core async stuff inside of it. And then this steps through it kind of an arbitrary number of times, in this case, 10 times. And for this stepping, you can kind of think of uh, a debugger debugging your regular code where you're stepping line by line. Uh, but in this case, in simplistic terms, what you can think of it as doing is it's stepping those threads from core async call to core async call. And then after stepping it 10 times, we print out the state of the machine. So the state of the machine is maintained as, um, as the code is running, and it's can be produced as a closure data structure. And here you see it lists all the threads, all the channels, what's in the channels. Um, it shows you what takes and puts are blocked. Um, this is kind of a broad use of the word blocked. It doesn't map precisely to uh, what you'll find if you talk about parked or blocked threads inside of Core Async itself. This is just a more general term. Um, but here you can see like what all the threads are doing, what the last thing was done. Uh, basically, you can see the state of that overall machine as it's running. So if we take it a step further and change that original code to make use of some features that aren't in Core Async, so here I'm adding uh, actual string labels to the two channels involved, channel one and channel two, and I'm giving labels to the worker threads as well, T1, T2, and T3. Now I'll flip a couple of options on the step machine. I'll tell it to keep track of all the history of all the items that go through channels. And of course you can't do that in general, but there's specific cases where it might make sense to be able to do that. And then I'll flip this other switch to turn on uh, state tracing for the machine. And what that will do is every time it, the machine, the core async machine reaches a new state, it'll record, um, it'll capture the, the state, that, that map I showed before with all the threads and channels and what the state is. So for the talk, I made a little throwaway visualization tool based on this visualize library, and it reads through all those traces, and it can show you, you know, what happened during the execution of the machine, and you can step through it. This is showing a snapshot at a certain point in time. So all the, the rectangles here represent either threads or channels. Uh, the arrows between them, it analyzed like the whole history of the trace and figured out which threads put to which channels and which threads take from which channels. And so the, the direction of those arrows indicate that. 
Uh, the, the thread boxes, they're labeled T1 and T2 here. You can see they're annotated with indicators saying if they're reading or writing and what channel they're currently reading or writing from. Similarly, the channels are annotated here with two vectors. You see C1 and C2 both have two vectors after their name. The first vector is all the items that have ever passed through the channel, and the second vector is, are the items that are currently in the channel. So basically, what the, like my mental model when I'm thinking about this library is that these core async or these asynchronous functions that use core async operators are like uh, spring-activated wind-up toys. So you could think of having a toy, and you know it's got its exterior, and then inside of it there's various springs and gears, and you can wind it up, and then you can let it run. And as you're letting it run, you could imagine maybe just letting it run a little bit, you know, just the turn of one cog of one gear or you kind of let it run till it winds down, that sort of thing. But in any event, this blob of core async code is what's inside of that machine. So that's what I'm trying to render here, is that this border on the outside represents the outside of that function f that we were talking about, and this is just in general. And then inside of it, there's various threads and channels and things happening. So there's all this stuff going on inside the machine, which normally you can't see if you're just using straight up core async. But this tool lets you gain some visibility into what's inside of there. And of course, it's not all just what's inside of the machine. Uh, these machines will inevitably have channels that allow you to interact with it, either on the input side or on the output side. So this is my basic mental model that I'm, I have in mind with the library that uh, I'm talking about today. So like I said, with the kind of wind-up toy, you can think of two ways of letting it step or do its thing. One is just take the smallest increment possible. And that's what step machine does. If you just say, if you ask a machine to step, it will choose one of the threads and let it run from the place it currently is to basically its next invocation of a core async call. So it's kind of taking the smallest increment it could from a core async perspective. The other operation you could run is you could ask it to step all. And what this does is you can think about that wind up machine. It's like just let it do its thing until it stops. And just because it stops doesn't mean that it can't do anything in the future. You might like, touch it and it might start working again, but at least it's kind of quiesced for the moment. And depending on what you're doing, either one of these modes might make sense. If you're more worried about the internal operation of how all your threads are working, just single stepping might make sense. But if you're more focused on kind of the outside, the interface of how you work with it, it might make more sense to just kind of let it run down between, between steps. So both of these calls, from the calling threads perspective, are asynchronous. That is, the machine will just go off and do its thing separate from you. If you want to sync up with it, there's corresponding calls to actually wait for it to finish, either a single step or wait for it to, to wind completely down. So all these mechanisms I'm talking about, the basic idea is to turn this core async execution from a black box into a white box that you can see inside of to be able to further reason about what ha what's happening, what the current state of that machine is. So these are all means of accomplishing transparency. Um, this is a list of all the operators that are supported currently by the library. Uh, notably missing is our transducers because this work predates that, so it's not in there. Uh, Here's an example of using um, another one of the core async operators, partition, which will just divide up the items coming through a channel, in this case into pairs. So we write in one, two, three, negative nine, we get out pairs of those on the output channel. And the point of this is that not only can you use this um, step async library for visualizing and seeing what your code does, but you can also use it for understanding what the built-in operators do as well. So in this example, you know, our code is, is creating channel one, and then we create channel two by a partition call, and we just have one thread, T1. But if we look over here and visualize what actually got created, we see our T1 and our C1, but then we see these additional channels and threads that were created by the partition operator itself. So we gain visibility into what those, uh, the built-in operators are doing. So other aspects of features that we have, um, you might have a large network with lots of channels and Go threads uh, talking on them, and you might just be debugging part of it. So there's mechanisms in place to allow you to send items onto channels from outside of the step machine and from inside the step machine out. 
I just showed a simple case of a single function f, but you could break it down into f and g and h and compose those and run them under the debugger and it would do what you expect. I didn't talk about alt s. It's basically like um, c select for sockets where you can do, you can read from many channels simultaneously and only one of them that's available to be read from will actually be read from. Um, you can actually also use that in the other direction. So you can selectively try to write to many channels at once and only one will succeed. That's not supported today just because it was a blind spot in my kind of view of how I used Core Async. Um, but there's no fundamental reason it couldn't be extended to do that. It supports sliding and dropping buffers, which is a feature of Core Async. Um, and then it also supports this idea of conditional breakpoints. So instead of manually stepping it to where you want, you can register a breakpoint, which is basically a predicate function that will be given the state of the machine. It can do whatever computation it wants and say, should it stop or not? Um, so this is a case where you could start it running and, and it will stop when there's some important condition is met that you want to, to analyze better. So the basic idea of the library is it's gonna accomplish two things. It's gonna make the execution of core async code transparent. The other big item it takes on is trying to make it deterministic. So core async by itself is non-deterministic. At its core, it's about starting up these concurrent processes. By being concurrent, I mean the definition is there's a non-causal relationship there between what's happening. So that's non-deterministic. Um, in more concrete terms, you can think of many threads all trying to take from a channel that's empty. And then when an item arrives, there's this question of well, what thread does it go to? And that in core async is non-deterministic by design. So I think of the, all these issues as kind of a scheduling problem. So you've got many threads that can be run and you need to make a scheduler decision about which one to run next. And of course in core async, there's many of them running like in parallel on your machine. Um, so what step async does is it enforces them all to be run actually in series and it'll make scheduling decisions about which one to run next. So step async has this idea of, you know, it'll plug in a scheduler. If you implement the closure protocol, you can plug it in It'll call you every time it's got a decision to make and then you decide what to do. It comes with two scheduler algorithm, algorithms. Um, the first one by default is just a simple deterministic scheduler. So if you think of the scheduling space as kind of this maze that you have to walk through, it just kind of says always go left kind of thing. It always does the same thing. Um, the other one it has is, uh, that's provided with it is a random scheduler. So here it uses a pseudo random number generator to like generate a random number to inform the decision about what scheduling choice to make at each juncture. If you want to use that, you instantiate the step machine with a random seed, and then that will seed the, um, the execution path. That will seed all the random numbers that are generated to compute the execution path. And so if your code is uh, deterministic itself and that the only source of non-determinism is core async use, then this will allow you to um, deterministically run repeated executions of the exact same random path, pseudo random path, by giving it the same random seed. So this is an example where um, we've got some core async code that normally runs just fine but there's actually a latent deadlock hidden in this code. Um, so what this is doing is setting up two channels and then three threads. And if you look at it kind of closely, you'll see that worker thread one and worker two, they're in this kind of embrace. So worker one writes to channel one, worker two receives a message from it and on channel one and then writes to channel two, which W1, which worker one receives. So they're kind of talking to each other. Both these Channels, I've explicitly you know, made them with size zero, which they would have by default, but there's no buffering there, which means the producers and consumers have to rendezvous at um, the time uh, when an item is produced. Um, if there's not an item there and you try and taking from it, try to take from it, you'll actually wait there for an item to appear. Similarly, if you write, you'll wait for a consumer to appear, or a producer, uh, yeah, consumer to appear before <laughs> your put completes. So the point is W1 and W2 are kind of locked in this embrace where they're talking to each other. And that will work fine as long as W3 doesn't run before W1. So W3 is writing the channel one, and it's, maybe it's kind of hard to see, but um, it'll actually cause it, the machine to deadlock if that happens before, um, before worker one completes. 
So this thread sleep in here is meant to represent like some kind of long running operation you'd have in your code. So maybe that usually takes a while. So usually this code works fine, but there is a race condition between worker one and worker three, which um, if worker one loses, then the machine will deadlock. So with code like this, and with the ability to provide these random seeds to the scheduler, we can make use of an idea that I think the genesis for me in this is um, Reed Draper's talk at Closure West last year, where he was talking about using test check to uh, programmatically find race conditions. So this is using test check, uh, which is a closure property-based testing library. Um, I'll kind of point out some of the highlights here. So what this is doing is it's saying, it's asking test check to randomly generate a value R, which we'll use as a random seed to seed our step machine. And then we'll run that function that we were just looking at. Um, we'll ask the machine to step all the way until it's done running. And then we'll look at the final output value, uh, output state that it arrives in. There's a token that's returned to either say all the, to indicate why it has completed or why it, the machine ran down, either because all the threads exited and there's nothing else to do, or because all the threads are currently blocked and they can't proceed. So this will pick 100 different random numbers, feed them in, and try to test that this property is always held true, that is the machine always exits. So if we run that, uh, if you read through all this at the bottom, it tries to find the smallest value that violates the property. In this case, it found the value one will violate the property. Uh, just to check to see if that's legit, we can run it through. So if we run it through with a random seed of zero, we see that it's all exited. We run it through with that random seed of one, which it indicated was a problem. We see, oh, it, everything's blocked, which means we've deadlocked. So this is pretty cool because what it does, it takes this concurrent code, it's non-deterministic, it's gonna be running different paths at different times, and it searches through all the different scheduling paths to find one that's problematic. So it's out there proactively trying to find race conditions for us. And not only that, but when it finds one, it gives us a value with which we can then reproduce the failing race condition sequence. And of course, once we can reproduce the problem, we're well on our way to you know, getting it fixed. Uh, if you want to visualize what this looks like, this is the actual deadlock case. So here you see worker one is writing the channel one, and then at the bottom worker two is writing the channel two, but there's nobody reading from either of those. So it's, it's gonna sit there forever. I think I'm in good shape on time. So any questions at any time, uh, raise your hand. Yes? Um, maybe this is a quick tip. If there's a deadlock that mm -hmm. occurs, how does your test actually finish? Right. So if there's a deadlock, how does the test finish? Well, what this code does is it asks the, um, it seeds the value into the step machine, which is a value of one, which it's gonna deadlock on. And then it says, okay, run until you can't run anymore. And then this quiesce wait just is basically like we're waiting on a promise for it to, to, to stop. So internally, the step machine schedules all these threads, um, makes scheduling decisions based on that random seed, and then the step machine is analyzing the, the state of all the threads and what they're doing, and it determines that nothing else can be run. So when nothing else can be run, it returns from this quiesce wait call and says, okay, I'm done running. There's nothing else to do. So, yes. Right, and it depends, like oftentimes your core async code is spawning go blocks, which are running asynchronously. So really, you're not blocked as a caller into that, so the test wouldn't necessarily block. It's just there's this machine out there that you can't see into that is in a state which is deadlocked. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so you had a call with three threads inside of worker three. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, so the way, so this is starting up these three threads. It's only gonna run these threads ever in sequence. So at some point it decides to run this go block from basically you can think of run from initiation to the first core async call, which is here. So it, run, it runs that at one point in the overall sequence and nothing else is running at the same time. 
So just however long that takes, it takes a second and then it finishes. Yes, that's right. So the tick of the machine, it's not per line of code, it's between core async calls, essentially. Yeah. Does this work with the default core async build macro, or is this a re-implementation of that? Right, yeah. I've got a slide on that, if you can just wait a couple slides, so. I'll press on now. Okay, another source of non-determinism are timeouts. So timeouts, if you call timeout 200, it makes a channel, which after 200 milliseconds will produce a value, which is nil. But anyway, you can, um, you can treat timeouts like channels, but that's another source of non-determinism, right? Because you don't know the sequence in which timeouts are gonna fire exactly. The way step async handles that is none of the timeouts you in your code ever fire unless someone tells it to fire. So externally, if you have one of these step machines, you can ask it, what are all the timeouts in the machine? And it'll give you a, a data structures like this. <laughs> And then if you want to programmatically fire one of those under your control, you make a call into the step machine and saying, say, fire this timeout now. So you can kind of get control of that source of non-determinism. All right, this is your, your, your question. So this is the same example from the very beginning, but now I added on the namespace information to show that we're using these closure core async operators. So if you want to use step async the way it currently is, what you do is you bring in step async version of these operators instead. And if you do that, then the function that you write here with these, if you don't run it in a step machine, then it'll just delegate all that to built-in core async, and it'll operate just like core async. But it gives you the function that you produce like this is a function that could be run inside of a step machine to do all this kind of um, controlled execution. So this leads to another way of understanding well, what is step async. It's an alternate implementation of a big chunk of core async, in particular the channels and the operators. Once you have the primitives, actually most of the operators are just a really straight port of the core async code. Um, there's a few of them that do more exotic things, but many of them are just a straight port. It's just built on putting and taking from channels. Um, it doesn't re-implement the Go macro, so it just intercepts all the calls to go and kind of registers what's happening, but then it delegates all the work to the Go macro. So it's a different, it's an alternate implementation of the core async operators, and where core async focuses on kind of these non-functional parameters of being very efficient and really enabling parallelism, so not like, kind of like squashing the opportunity for concurrency. Uh, step async instead focuses on doesn't focus on those at all. In fact, it's all serialized and it's horribly inefficient, but it's deterministic and it's transparent and you can control it programmatically from the outside. So this is a glimpse into uh, implementation details. Uh, there's a def type which defines the step machine itself. It has a bunch of values, many of those are refs. Um, inside the operators, um, it's coordinated via the, the closure STM. Um, it's not necessary, this isn't necessarily the way you'd have to write it, it's just kind of stylistically the way um, I chose to do it. So to understand the implementation, you think about regular core async, you're making these go threads, you're making these channels. Um, those really, they're not like unified in any way. They're just objects on the heap that happen to have references to each other. If you watch Timothy Baldridge's video on um, garbage collection with Core Async, he really kind of makes that point. So there's no sense in which these are like centralized together and there's anyone watching what's happening. It's just however they happen to be laced together on the heap and that's how you get garbage collection of all these things. Well, Step Async doesn't follow that model at all. Step Async has this centralized view of everything that's happened within that machine it all gets pulled together in a central place where it can keep track of these are all the threads, these are all the channels, and then it really intercepts all the core async calls that you make and registers them in that central place, and then that central place decides, kind of spoon feeds out then, you know, what to actually allow to run next. And this picture is kind of horribly confusing, but the main point is there is this central place that's, that's tracking it all. Which is not at all what you want, like, in general. Like, so I think, like, core async is I'm sure doing the right things in, in this regard, but there are some contexts in which it's useful to be able to 
have more visibility, have more control. And so if those are things that are useful to you, then, then this is a possibility for you. So this is an example that's a bit different than the others that I showed. Um, so what this is doing, it's, uh, again, one of these asynchronous functions called accumulator. This is actually taking in an input channel and an output channel, which I hadn't shown in the previous example. But um, you can do that. Um, and what this does is it reads all the values from the input channel, it expects them to be numeric values, and um, it adds, it keeps an accumulation of all the sum of all the values that have come in. So it reads a value in, adds it to the, the old sum, and writes that sum out on the output channel, and then sits there in a loop doing that. So if you ignore whatever magic core async is doing, you can think of there's like a value on the stack somewhere that's kind of accumulating this state. And the point here is there's some state inside of this function that isn't like strictly part of the core async state. So it's not like a thread or a channel or something like that. It's just some other state of the machine, uh, the actual virtual machine. Um, so if we run code like this, and again, flip some switches here. So I'll set this action history to true, and I've elided some, elided some code here that uh, makes it a little messy. But if you run this in a step machine, then you can do things like this. So um, here I'm showing I write in a value of one, which causes a value of one to come out on the output channel. And then on the input channel, I put in a value of two, so I get three, which is the sum of one and two. And I write in three, which is the sum of the previous value, three and three. Um, so that's just like what you would expect. But then, again, if all that code is deterministic, and the only source of non-determinism is um, uh, the query sync calls, and if it's purely functional, so there's not side effects that are, that are bad to rerun, then you can do things like this. You can take that step machine at this point, after we've written in one, two, and three, and so we've got a value on a stack somewhere saying um, there's a six in as the current state of the machine. Um, we can ask it to go backwards. So we kind of say, go back to the previous state, like go back a couple of steps. It turns out to be two based on the way that like when you put something in, there's like multiple steps to actually putting something into a channel. But anyway, we go back two steps and then ask for the machine. That returns us a new machine. We can ask for that machine to kind of stop doing whatever it's doing, which in this case you can kind of think of it as going backwards. Um, and then what we can do is we can write in a new value. So write in a value of four. And so we get out a value of seven now. So that's significant because it's taken back a value that was written in before and gotten that code back to a state that it was in before and now put in a four and you get out seven, which means it's now, it's, it's back in the state that it was. So it's as if we just did one, two, and then four here. The three has kind of disappeared. So um, this is really just an experimental feature in the code. I just kind of did it because I could see that I could. Um, I don't know that there's any real practical value to it, but it was, um, it was kind of fun to do. And um, if you think about it, you can figure out what it's actually doing, kind of see behind the curtain here. It's not really stepping the machine backwards. Rather, it's making a new machine and stepping forwards from the beginning of time until you know, just leaving off the last couple of steps which gives you a new machine that's back in the state that the old machine was in just before you did um, the last two things. So that's what I have prepared. Um, you can see the code up on GitHub. Um, it's code that we're currently using um, in the production code on one of our projects. Um, so there's, what we're using is a thin slice of the functionality that I showed today. So there's a thin slice, which I'm confident in, and I think is solid. But as taken as a whole, it's really proof of concept code. Um, so it needs some kind of care and feeding. Um, but like I said, we are using it in production code. And the application we're using it in, it's not for debugging at all. But what we're using it for is uh, we're using Amazon Simple Workflow to model distributed workflow executions. And the basic model with that is that you have these concurrent workflow executions that are running, and then they produce and they consume these events. So it's a model that matches closely to core async. And so on this project, what we do is we represent the logic of those workflow executions in core async. So what you can think of is, um, you know, as the vision plays out, you can say, you know, we'll write 
you know, say a dozen workflows that all work, have to work together. So we write those as straight up core mm -hmm. async code, and we can run those in a single JVM and kind of get all the kinks worked out. And they're just talking to each other as just plain old core async. But then using step async and using some additional machinery to kind of bridge the gap between the distributed world and um, core async, once we're happy that all our logic is sound, we can then kind of promote those workflow, those uh, core async threads up into these workflow executions that are now running in a distributed fashion out on Amazon cluster uh, under Amazon Simple Workflow. And so step async is critical in that role because what happens is there might be a workflow running on a, on a given machine. So it's receiving events and it's making decisions, producing output events. And um, for whatever reason, just you can imagine now we need to move that to another machine. And so when we go to move that to another machine, the ability for us to programmatically like access the state of that machine and programmatically like recreate the state of that machine on another host um, is what enables us to kind of maintain this illusion that these things um, are just running in process when they're actually kind of being time sliced across hosts. So um, that's all I have prepared. Thank you. And um, yeah, I have time for questions. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I have uh, two questions. First of all, really, really cool. Oh, thank you. No. <laughs> so the question was, can you just drive it with data, not with channels? Now, you have to use the Core Async API or the API that I've shown. I'm not, I guess I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, because in the end, you trace the execution through this code path, right? And then you end up with data. You're printing it, right? Yeah. So just inject that in. Like, say, this is my current state. I'm in this state. Now run from there. Yeah. I see. I don't want to write a program. I want to give you data. So certainly for the parts that are being explicitly tracked by the step machine, that is the channels, the threads, the listeners, I mean, there's certainly no reason you can't inject those things in. The problem is there are actual, there's actual code somewhere that has go blocks that's in the current state. And that state is not represented inside of the step machine, but it's relying on there being actual go blocks somewhere that the, cust that the user wrote that are in a certain state. And without stepping through all the states to get them in the right place, then I don't see a path with the way it is right now to get to make that happen. Yeah, but from the perspective of just channels and channel interactions, I don't think the go blocks matter, right? Okay, we can talk about it offline. Okay. That would be that would be an idea. And the other okay. question I have for you is um, obviously one place you want to take core async proper is to have better visibility. And, and sort of the determinism part of this is something that is going to have Right. Well, I didn't show it. I did this really crude UI, which just kind of renders these things. I had a kind of a pseudo spec for like a real AI that would show you, or UI that would show you that these are the threads, these are the channels, here's how they're interconnected. And now I would kind of interactively explore it to see the current state. Um, and then obviously on the monitoring side, like you said, you can see, um, you can like emit information saying you know, what state all these different things are in. I haven't done work beyond that, though. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, was that a statement or a question? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, there was a, that example that I showed that I, I think is what you're talking about, where we're using test check to kind of run through the different paths to find. Um, a deadlock, 
But are you saying do like analysis to determine when there will be deadlock? I see. Yeah, it's where you try to reason about it and get it into a certain state, maybe. Or yeah. okay, so. No, I have not. That sounds interesting. And I guess, Rich, to one of your points about you wouldn't want the non or the yeah the non determinism in core async. Like I totally see that for let's say most use cases or almost all use cases. But I think there are use cases where that is what you want. Um, like that's what we want for that simple workflow example that I described. We, the, the performance of it is absolutely irrelevant. It's can we control the execution and is it deterministic? And so that's production code where that's how we want it to behave. And when I published the uh, synopsis of this talk, I was contacted by an outfit that's doing the same thing for simulation. So they're using core async as the fundamental abstraction or the, the means of describing their simulation. And they want to be able to control that from the outside to say, let's play it a little bit further, let's go back, let's go forward kind of thing. And so again, there it's not the raw performance of how fast it goes, but it's expressing their logic with those primitives and then running it in a controlled deterministic fashion. So, yeah. Do you have a sense for how hard it would be to port this to closure scripts? No. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it wouldn't be that hard. I mean, closure script is already running in this kind of serialized fashion, but I guess that's a total like tangential issue. Um, I haven't done anything with closure script. Uh, it doesn't strike me on the surface as being something that's hard for any reason. I just haven't done anything with it. Yeah. Um, so when you're step off, when you step to a point where the only thing blocking, every, every, if every thread is blocked on like a, a timeout, mm -hmm. is, does your step off introspect that and then complete the timeout? Or do you do that? Would you write another layer to do that? So the question is if you do the step all and all the threads are waiting on a timeout, what happens? What happens is, if you say step all and it sees that all of them are waiting on a timeout, that's just as if they're waiting on a regular channel. And it says, oh, they're all waiting and there's no input for them. And there's no input that will ever come to them unless someone programmatically calls that thing to make the timeouts fire. So, yeah. But you could do that then, right? You could go ahead and do that, look at the timeouts that are. Yeah, like absolutely. So I, I, I was going to contact you about the simulation framework. So I have ah, system, very good. And I see. Uh, Scott. Okay, I'm trying to crock what you said at the end, where you you, you use step async in a, in a mode of production where you're not you're not using it to step, but rather to uh, publish a diagram like this that enables you to promote your workflow to Amazon's infrastructure. Is that, is that correct? Um, that's not the way I would say it. So what we're doing is um, so we need some logic to run for a workflow. And that's represented in core async code. So we get a call for a workflow. We fire up one of these machines. Um, we get it to the state we want. And then we give it some input. Say, this is new input that's arrived. I want you to tell me what to do. I think of it like the matrix. So you got people. And people know how to interact with each other. They have brains. They take an input. They produce output. But the matrix, they wired up these people's brains. And they just like stimulated it with stuff and then kind of got something out. I guess they got heat out. But, um, so I think of it like that. You've got this, core, this asynchronous machine, which is like a person. It can take input and it does things. But we're putting it in this matrix where we just wire it up and we say, here's your reality. Here's the events that have happened to you. And ignore whatever you do. But now here's the new event. Drop in the new event. And whatever it does, it decides, oh, this is, what, this is my output. This is a, an action I would like to take. And then we take that and we register that with simple workflow saying, this is what this workflow should do now. And, um, one of the things we do, since we have programmatic control of it, we can do things like ask that machine when it's done running, which is a problem with core async. If you have some core async code and you call into it, like just a, that one of those functions f that does core async things, how do you know when it's done? You, you don't, right? Unless you do something explicit to allow it to communicate out to you. If you just fire it up and it runs, you don't know if it's ever produced its last event that it's going to produce. Um, so this gives us, I mean, you can solve that problem. You can have like an output channel, and it writes to the output channel and closes it when it's done, and you see the close, so you know it's done. But this allows us to just more generally like fire up the code and let it run for a while, and it doesn't have to do anything explicit to tell us when it's done. We can programmatically look at it and see that it's done. I think I still have time if there's more. You had a question.
No, but you, yeah, obviously you could do that, yeah. I'm not familiar with the mechanism you described. It's entirely possible that if I knew about it, I should have, would have used it. Um, I will say that recently I got to see Rich's talk from Euroclosure where he's talking about the implementation of channels. And uh, it's a great talk, and it would have been good for me to watch that before I did this um, because it obviously has uh, you know, very precise thinking about some of the invariants that, that need to hold while you're, while you're doing this. But uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I definitely recommend that. I think we're out of time, is that right? All right, I think we're out of time. I'm happy to take questions down here afterwards. Uh, thank you.